My name is Chuck. I'm a Boeing employee, and I'm going to talk to you about design, design assured Linux using DO178C. Uh, Yocto open embedded is sort of the substrate of all this, in case I forget to mention that. Uh, just a little bit about myself. <clears throat> I have a BS in mathematics. Uh, I've also done an insane amount of coursework and a bunch of other stuff, because one of the cool benefits of working for Boeing is that they, as long as you can justify it, business case, you can take whatever schooling you want. So uh, I am a perpetual student that way. Uh, I uh, am noted in the credits of several early editions of the Red Hat Linux Bible. Early editions because once I got paid to do this, I didn't have any time to do any of the <laughs> stuff. Uh, I'm also the co-author of an uh, old book, Linux Toys, um, way out of date. Don't waste your time. Uh, it's, it was fun to write. It's a great book, but it's way out of date now. Uh, I was the president. Now I'm the benevolent dictator for life of the Tacoma Linux Users Group. Um, and then uh, I've got 20 years in as a Boeing software engineer. I was inducted into the technical fellowship last year, which I guess is like tech principal at other companies. And then if you flew here on a Boeing aircraft, you were probably using, or the airplane you were flying on probably had a Linux, embedded Linux OS that I was responsible for. Um, and we'll go into some more details here. So this is some of my early work, the stuff on the right, not the left. Um, this is Simone Biles and Michaela Skinner sitting in the flight deck of a 787. I was stoked when I saw this. I sent this to my parents, my whole family, because just to the left of Simone Biles' shoulder, you can see the display in there. OK, see the rectangles and stuff. That is called the electronic flight bag. I did a lot of work on that system. I knew that like the back of my hand. I jumped out of my seat when I saw that. <clears throat> I know the OS, everything back and forth. Um, that was the first entry into a concept called e-enabling. If you go to Boeing's public site, you, or you can Google for it, there's a whole paper on um, the electronic flight bag written by former chief engineer Dave Allen, who uh, he has since passed away due to pancreatic cancer, tragic loss. Uh, he was actually part of the standards effort on DO-178B and all that, so he has been everywhere. I, I, am, I am the luckiest person in the world to have worked under him. But uh, he was responsible for that, and that is the first time there's an insane amount of data, you can probably imagine, riding around on aircraft buses. It's insane, right? And uh, starting in the mid to late 90s, airlines were like, it's expensive to run an aircraft. How do we take advantage of this data and make it cheaper to run an aircraft? And, I need to make my pilots not carry 70 pounds of paper. We could use people revenue paying customers and all that. So that was the advent of the electronic flyback. And e-enabling, so basically extracting that data from the bus and making it actually useful. There's an SDK for that electronic flyback. If you work for an airline and the airline has purchased the SDK, you can write apps for that environment. And that has continued on to this day. And so that's the old I've been working on way cooler stuff. Um, I, I'm going to talk to you about our development environment now. Obviously, I can't talk to you about the proprietary stuff, but um, definitely Google for stuff. Uh, it does appear in the news here and there, and I'm like, that's really cool. I'm excited by that. Um, let's see. So first question, quiz. Can software be certified, true or false? What do you guys think? True or false? Raise your hand if you think true. Raise your hand if you think false. Are you both right? <laughs> It depends, OK? So you can only certify in aerospace, OK? You can only certify systems. I mean, with, with Zen, you're talking about adhering to a standard, OK? You can only certify systems. That means I cannot, if anybody says to you, I have a certified Linux kernel for aerospace, they're lying to you. They're trying to scam you out of your money. You can only certify systems. So you can take and certify an entire Linux OS with a set of requirements, the whole nine yards. That system can be certified, but then that's got to be loaded onto an airframe, airframe with its own cert plan. So it's a lot like, I guess you'd probably say it's like building codes, or it's like this building was built at this time, so it's responsible for these particular codes. So for the 777 airframe, my job has a certain amount of difficulty for certification in a 787 airframe is going to be different because that was a later airframe than the 777. So the standards are different. And a lot of the work I do is what we call multi-model. And so we try to you know, do the Zen diagram. Um, vendor, I'm thinking Zen here. Venn diagram, uh, the, the, the most difficult piece. And it usually covers all of them. So software systems are like airplanes. Airplanes are just system of system of system of system of system. In fact, one of the really important career paths at Boeing is system engineer. And, and I'd been at Boeing so long, I didn't even realize that's not well understood what a system engineer is. But you're the engineer responsible for all the boundary layers, I'm sorry, um, 
connect connectivity between all these systems. I am not a system engineer. I am a software engineer. I build a system. I'm responsible for a system that fills a role here. But I work with system engineers, and these people are just incredible. They're, they've got encyclopedias inside their heads. Every time one retires, it's, it's a depressing and tragic event. Um, updates, uh, you know, version one, version two, that kind of thing. It's not just push it out. Okay, there's a whole process for getting these things out. Software is managed like airplane parts. We call them loadable software airplane parts, just like a piece of metal. It's got a part number, it's got a whole chain of custody required to it. In fact, a lot of it is like, I'll finish a release and then like six, eight months later, I'll be like, has that been out yet? And so, yes, it's finally getting out to the fleet. But that's, there's just a whole nother apparatus that, that sends all, all, you know, all of our releases out to the fleet. When we make a change or we update it, uh, we have to go through what's called a software change impact analysis. So we certify it once, and then obviously no one's ever happy. You want more and more, and there's bug fixes and all that. And so we have to go through a software change impact analysis to release an update uh, to that going forward. And these are embedded Linux OSs. I should also mention that uh, e-enabling, this is a member, this is, this is um, making use, um, democratizing information on the airplane. So it's, it's real time doesn't really play a huge role. There are some real time aspects to this, but the vast majority of the Linux OS work we do is actually not real time, although it is safety critical. Uh, let's see, okay, so let me give you a, just a rough idea of what the regulatory environment looks like in aerospace. We have uh, in the United States at Boeing in particular, we have what's called an ODA, yeah, not to scale. <laughs> It's really not scale. Uh, it's called ODA, Organizational Designation of Authority. And that means there are Boeing employees who have literally more power than the CEO. They can stop everything they are called. We call them engineering unit members, EUMs. They are like lawyers in the amount of training they have to get. They have to go through a whole process. They have to get it. It's called, we call it getting the ticket. Um, this FAA has to, they go through this panel interview and, and everything. And you get the ticket. And then you get your, you have an EUM attached to a project, and they go, through, they shepherd you through the entire certification process. Um, they have audits called soy audits, stage of involvement audits. Uh, each level you have to meet a certain set of requirements, and there's findings between them. They shepherd us through that. So that's a long-winded way of saying I am not a lawyer. I know enough to do my job, and I make sure that I have a really good EUM that I work with that I can ask tons and tons and tons and tons of questions, and treat them very nice. <laughs> so. Um, Regulatory always goes back to basically government. The Constitution gave us the Congress, which gave us the Air Commerce Act, which gave us the FAA. EASA has a similar history, but it's huge, and I just didn't have enough space <laughs> on there. Um, so, but what uh, the regulatory agencies are not responsible for telling anybody what to do. They just they just create the objectives. They uh, the Federal Aviation Rec uh, Regulate FARS just in very broad terms uh, make some statements. Those are the objectives. EASA has similar objectives. The industry gets together with radio, uh, tele, uh, radio, uh, RTCA, sorry. RTCA and you're okay. Those are the standards bodies that bring together objectives and consensus from the industry. And those create these funny documents here that uh, are the approved means of compliance. So if you want to get a, get a release of software into the field, the happy, the easy path is just to use DO-178. If you have object-oriented code, you want DO-332. If you want to qualify software tools, you got to go DO-330, et cetera, et cetera. DO-336A is a new emerging, uh, that's uh, software security, called cybersecurity. This is the first time, by the way, we actually have what we call negative requirements. So all the time, philosophically, you can't prove a negative, right? Well, guess what? we got to start proving a negative now. DO-356A now requires it. Um, these are all the things get a, that a CERT plan for a particular airframe says we're going to apply to those standards. So I think we were talking earlier about what standard applies. That has to do with when the airframe is shipped out and what, what standards the FAA wants us to and EASA wants us to apply to. So if we're doing something incredibly novel that even DO-178 doesn't cover, and, it, and a couple times we have, um, what you'll do, since that means that compliance doesn't cover what you're trying to do, you'll actually write an issue paper and submit that to the FAA and EASA and say, does, does this meet the aviation regulations as you see it? And generally what you can, depending on what it is, that, that would probably ideally end up either as an advisory circular or it will end up in a standard at some point in the future. Um, and surprisingly, there is. I've, I've, there's one I've been involved in and there's another one that's probably going to happen as well that um, 178 doesn't cover that uh, and it's software. Okay. so. Uh, most of the work I do, though, is dictated by DO-178C. 
Uh, when I started at Boeing as DO-178B, my chief engineer was part of the DO-178 effort. Um, this is industry accepted guidance for satisfying airworthiness, airworthiness requirements. The FAA does not tell you how to do it. They just say what it needs to be. Industry decides how they're going to comply. There's really two important sentences that, that dictate like my life. Okay? Does the design adequately reflect the hazard? So we have a functional hazard assessment. Uh, when business decides they want a new feature, someone's got to sit there and do a, a comprehensive functional hazard assessment. And that's when they decide what level of hazard this complies with. And then software, and then, and then I'm sorry, I jumped ahead a little there. And then at the end, does the implementation match the design? That is the whole soft, I mean, if I were to boil down all the certification work I do, it meets those two sentences. Does the design reflect the hazard and does the implementation match the design? It's called design assurance level. We assure the design meets this particular level. So for Dow, we call the design assurance level. Dow E has no safety effect. We call it operational approval. Usually that's when a regulator, or EUM, just probably goes on a test flight and says, looks good, ship it. Um, obviously, when you're DAL-E, you can't do as much. The higher your DAL, uh, DAL-A, um, and I understand in some other industries, this is inverted, D would be the highest, and so, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like wiring grades too, right? Uh, one odd is bigger than the 13, anyway. Um, so I usually work in the, the minor, so uh, the minor, and the bars are relative levels of difficulty. The big jump is from D to C. In D, we have what's called high-level requirements. These are functional requirements. System shall do this, system shall do that. You're not even specifying kernel-level stuff. Generally, you're not really specifying kernel-level stuff. That's sort of implied that you're going to have a boundary layer between software and hardware, and that's usually a Linux kernel. Sometimes we'll say it will have some sort of replication that's occurring along this bus, and so you'll have to say, I have to have this driver that does this. There are only 26 objectives. Only two have to be um, uh, satisfied with independence. That means, like, hands off. Someone, we have to prove somebody else uh, satisfied those. All the way up to... Um, C requires you do low-level requirements, and that means like every line of code has to, not every line of code, but you could practically write the code just from the low-level requirements. It's a phenomenal amount of work, especially if you look at the Linux kernel, you peel out the drivers, how many still millions of lines of code is, you use kconfig to even peel it down even more, but you have to have low-level requirements for every line of code, so it's a daunting task to do that. And then um, major and uh, catastrophic and hazardous, uh, uh, hazard, catastrophic, Technically speaking, you need to follow every code path with every possible input value. That's not possible. That's impossible to do. It's physically impossible. So what we call is we have what's called modify condition decision coverage. And you can make some guesses and assumptions. Uh, uh, and it requires experience and expertise to do that. C just requires code coverage. You just need to make sure all your tests cover all the lines of code. So like I said, I work in mostly d &E, So this should just give you some flavor of what I'm operating in. And I have not had to solve problems in the A, B, and C, very many problems in the A, B, and C space uh, going forward. Cool. Okay. So to meet the burden, nothing I am tell you, telling you is written in DO 178C as thou shalt do this. Okay. So if you look at anything I'm going to talk to you about, I, I, there's nothing that's in there that says you have to do it this way. I've been doing this for long enough and tried a ton of stuff. And I, I know it has worked. I know it has not worked. I know it is painful when it's sitting down with, an, with a, a regulator. What is not painful when it's sitting down with a regulator? So, but the big point, point here is the burden of proof is on the engineer. So make it easy on yourself. Okay? Make it really easy on yourself. Simpler is a lot easier to prove. Everybody's really smart. There, it takes a high bar to get into Boeing and to do this stuff. They're smart, but they're busy. So you need to make it simple so you can digest and move on and understand this stuff. Regulators and software engineers we are human too, so it requires, you know, you don't know what someone else is coming to the table with, so you, you have to be able to, you know, work, work with everybody. And then one size, you know, there's more than one way to do it, right? One size does not fit all. So what I, again, what I'm telling you is not like the way you need to do it. I'm saying this is what has worked, and there is a lot of software flying around an aircraft that has used this approach. That's all I'm saying. Oh, wrong direction. Okay, so human error is a symptom of bad design, and now here I'm talking about how you manage your development team, okay? So if your workflow uh, is well-meaning people are causing problems, 
don't blame the developer. That's probably because you designed your workflow wrong, and it's a good opportunity for improvement. So the requirements for what I'm doing here, I have to support hundreds of internal developers, tens of, tens of embedded distributions, and it's got to support distributed application layer development, meaning there is application level functionality within these embedded OSs that are not being done by the embedded development team, but the OS, embedded OS is an integration point, okay? It's got to be simple, turnkey. I got to be able to tell a developer within a couple of steps, a brand new developer, a couple of steps, how to deploy and build. It's got to be repeatable. Two developers have to get the same result, okay? This isn't just creating the same binary, but two developers should be able to work from the same set of documentation, get the same result, because I use a Mac. Some Boeing engineers use a Windows machine. Um, I even one have one engineer who uses a Linux. Uh, they, they got rid of the Boeing image and use Linux on their desktop. Uh, it's got to be consistent, which means uh, if I am pulling in something that says someone decided to use Gradle or Bazel for their uh, application level build development, I have to be able to have a consistent way of pulling it into embedded build. BitBake is great for that, right? It's a thin wrapper around whatever you want to use to build uh, your stuff. Okay, it's got to be consistent and work and dovetail into the existing system. I can't have a third party application developer do something that's going to have ramifications and cause me to change the build a lot. It's got to be extensible. We have to add things into, think of it as a pipeline. It's got to be extensible. Have to be able to add things in. Testing, if we want to do automated testing, it's got to be qualified, so we want to be able to put that into the pipeline. We have to do configuration manage, meaning uh, project leaders have to be able to turn dials and knobs on the development environment, and that's just got to, you know, when a developer does a pull, that's got to make the changes in their environment without having to say, hey, everybody, send out that email, you know that email, right? Hey, everybody, do this today, and three people didn't see it, two didn't understand it, and then you've, the rest of your day is shot because they are confused and broke something. You can't have that. And of course, it's gotta be traceable. Change requests have to go all the way back. Uh, you have to be, I'm sorry, go back to your change uh, control. Whatever change control system you're using, you have to be able to show a regulator that you've done your code reviews, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's just do a little step back how we build distros. This works for embedded and Red Hat, the whole nine yards. When I started at Boeing, we didn't have Yocto open embedded. So I used Red Hat and we did an RMP, RPM based embedded build. Obviously we didn't just use um, the RPMs that came from Red Hat and Red, Red Hat Linux. We just used the concept. Step zero, of course, is you have to build your native tools. Uh, because you do not, you know, even if you're building, if you're on x86, building for an x86 target, you can't use the compiler resident on your system because that's going to build application stuff that is generally tailored for that environment, you know. So you want to build native tools that allow you to abstract that. Um, then you want to, you got a bill of materials of, of all the individual application level stuff you want in your environment. Your Linux kernel is one of those. You build your intermediates. Then you create a, a root FS. Uh, you'd think of that as like a sparse loopback device, something like that. Uh, you mount that, install the packages into there, sort of as a chroot um, or a, a, a fake root. Uh, you generate the image. A lot of times, what you'll do if you're if you're building an installer, we're installing to bespoke hardware, so we don't need Anaconda. That's not necessary. Installers are actually really simple because we know everything. We know the the hard drive. We know where everything's located. So it's just a rote step-by-step -step script. So. A lot of times what we'll build is the final image will be uh, a, a little Linux OS that the init process just runs an install script. And embedded inside, the, inside that ISO is the blob that is the embedded OS that then gets installed to the system. That's usually uh, like, a, I don't want to call it a firmware OS, but a base OS that then in the field you can data load on top of that to a fully functioning operational environment. Okay. Um, and then around 2017, this was mature enough that we said, great, we can, and it did way, way, way better. I could go on for days about this, um, about all the things it does better than the system that, that I built and a lot of people maintained uh, within Boeing. So I it was, it did a, did a, a, a couple of year long test run, and it was like, great, we're going to go to the Yocta Open Embedded Room. I pulled this from the Yocta Open Embedded Documentation. Uh, I don't really have time to go through all of this. I definitely recommend they have unbelievably good docs and they take fixes. So if you find something you want to change in their docs, send a patch. Um, 
pack, you know, it's, it's basically the same thing we were doing, package-based builds with the ability to turn dials and knobs. We did it in spec files, and then you could use scripts that would template the spec files. This is just much cleaner, much nicer. Plus, there's testing built in, CVE checks built in. Uh, you can look at your build graph. You can come up with an SVG of your build graph, which is still difficult to read. Uh, and it builds your SDK. So this is just so much. Oh, also, you don't have to build any of your native, native tools, right? You just say which machine you're building to, and bam, that's all done for you. It's like, who wouldn't want this? So yeah, it was total no-brainer uh, to switch to this. It was great. Um, just in, for those of you who haven't used Yocto Open Embedded, this is what a BitBake recipe looks like. It is, I call it, internally I just say to anybody who's never heard of it, I say it's just a thin, a BitBake recipe is just a thin wrapper around whatever you're using to build your existing uh, code, make, Gradle, Ant, Maven, all those kinds of things. It's just a thin wrapper. Um, as far as I can tell, I mean, it creates an abstract syntax tree, so it looks to me like it's Turing complete, uh, that you can do whatever you want in there. Uh, you can, because it does. you can inline Python and shell. This is a very simple one. You notice that um, the source URI points to the source code. We'll, we'll get to that. There's a checksum, so your project repository is going to know if someone upstream meddles with the bundle that you're trying to pull down. And of course, license auditing, that's really important. Um, you need to know when something changes, especially as an OEM, you need to know that you're not going to get your company into trouble. So that's a really important feature. Um, and then of course, if you too want to go home and build your own Linux environment, Linux OS rather, uh, and then run it and play around with it, you can do so in five commands and a few hours. That's pretty easy to do. It's not that hard. Um, and then once you've done that, uh, it's, it's really easy to just go back and look how it's configured, and then you can build your own uh, distro. I typically do that uh, when I want to spin up something. I'll start with like, um, like a rocky Linux uh, VM and just build my own, and then I'll just go off with, with my own uh, Linux. Um, I have a, a personal project that I've kept hidden on GitHub, but I probably should open it up uh, for my own Linux that I, that I curate and play with um, using, using, using this. Um, OK, so what did not work? Remember, I don't mean to slay anybody's favorite tool. I'm not attacking anybody or anything, uh, especially Git submodules. You, you want to see people get upset, you talk about Git submodules, right? It's, there's only two sides to that. Vim and Emacs is, was the same thing. Out of tree, we'll talk about that. Out of tree source code, talk about that. And hybrid builds. I'll explain what those mean here in a second. OK, so uh, remember, I have to serve a lot of developers. I have to make sure they're productive. Nothing wrong with submodules, but every objection to submodules is overcome by more complexity. And it's usually by people who don't understand they're telling you to do something a lot more complex. And I don't want to have to create, like, I, I love Git. I, it's, it's, it's magic. It is. But I don't need every single developer to be an expert in Git uh, to be able to be um, useful. I also, it does val violate the do one thing or the single responsibility principle. It, it obscures the boundaries between local and upstream code, which really makes me nervous for safety critical stuff. I do not, I do not feel comfortable with that at all. And really, at the end of the day, there's, it's, it's, it's too little benefit. Uh, what I'm showing you here, you know, hopefully will come clear, is a curated environment. Um, nothing about Git submodules makes my life easier. It only makes it harder. OK. Out of tree source code. Now, if you're used to meta layers, you know that it's all out of tree source code. It's a bit baked recipe with a URI that points to a bundle, and that's awesome. Don't ever change that. That's great, OK? Because no one's going to get all those cats to move in one direction and put their source code in one repository. That's just absurd, except inside of a company like Boeing, where uh, you have embedded builds that have been decomposed into hundreds of BitBake recipes, but all almost interrelated, maintained by not hundreds of teams, maybe two or three teams, tops. When we do releases, tagging and branching and tracing and code reviews and standards and all that, uh, you can't imagine how difficult it is if you make me curate that across hundreds of Git repositories. It ain't happening, OK? So I've seen people on the uh, Yocto mailing list say, do you people really do this? Yes, we include all the source code decompose at the, at the base is the BitBake recipe, and then a subdirectory, and then all your source code there. I promise you, it makes life a lot easier. We've tried it the other way, and it's very, very painful to maintain hundreds of Git repositories. It's like the wild, wild west, and it makes your job a lot more difficult. So outside, 
don't ever stop doing this. Inside, you, there are good reasons not to do this to, and to have entry source code. And many, 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 many thanks to Richard Purdy. I sent a desperate email saying, we found that when you made a change to certain source code in your tree, it actually didn't trigger an expiration of the, of the cache. And he's like, oh, you know, I was testing something about that. Try this patch. I'm like, thanks. That's exactly what I needed. Um, and it solved it for us. I'll go more into that in a little bit. Another one is hybrid builds. So when we were uh, um, testing uh, if we were going to go, which way we were going to go, Yacht to open embed or just stay with the, the RPM package-based uh, build environment, this is where we do half of it, the, the base layer, if you will, um, with the Yocto uh, Bitbake build, then the rest, uh, mostly CMake, but also Gradle. And then there'd be a script at the end that would smash that together into a loadable software airplane part, LSAP, right? It's fine, it's awful, don't do it. <laughs> so it, it was necessary at first, because you know this is aerospace, and you got to go baby steps. But once we're like, yeah, OK, open embedded will work. And this is great. This is awesome. Just it's time to cast that aside. Don't, don't do hybrid builds. Uh, just stick, go all, all in or all out. OK, so let's talk about what did work. Virtualization is a key tool. That's the most important enabler. And I mean virtualization for the developers and for test. But that's the key enabler that enables like everything else. So uh, mirroring, there's two types of mirroring I'll talk about. Pinning, how are we doing? Yeah, pinning, shimming. Uh, wrapping it together in a wrapper, and then building everything from source and recipe generation. Um, take a second here. As software engineers, we all, play, we all understand the difference between mechanism and policy, right? As someone who's building something, you want to build mechanism, you want to let the user decide policy. And this is a hotly contested thing in the Yocta open embedded world. Um, I think Richard, to his credit, has done a really good job preventing policy from invading into uh, the open embedded uh, and Yocto ecosystem because policy is not one size fits all. Mechanism should be generally one size fits all, but policy should not. So my motivation for a lot of doing this talk is when I need to say, hey, I think we should try and do this or add this to the code base, uh, I need to make a case for why this is good mechanism, not just my pet policy that I'm interested in. So that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this. I hope I can at least make a case or at least start the beginning of a dialogue in that. Um, and I have unsolved problems at the end, so it ain't perfect. So let's talk about virtualization. Uh, let's start off. Oh, here. Yeah. Let's start off with there. You have a baseline set of features. Uh, that would be an image build. So a, a, a bit bake build would just be a base image. You can uh, imagine it's just a, a, a. You're not actually building an image directly, but you're inheriting it with other other with with a, a, other images. You add operational features. These are the things that the airline customers expect us to have in the embedded operating system. You add those, so the operational features image inherits the baseline features. Okay, and that is where you build your flyaway image. And also, it ain't that hard. You can build an operational appliance for that. Yes, we have built internally BB class functionality. You, there is an image type LSAP. Loadable software airplane part, and it will output. I'm sorry, we have an image type LSAP that will build LSAPs directly using uh, Arinx 665 3 LSAPs. That's a mouthful, but you can order the spec, and it will generate LSAPs directly straight from BitBake builds. We added BB class functionality for that. And then also, we added BB class functionality uh, that we do want to open source to generate OVA appliances. So I have sent a VP who is very, very intelligent, but not a software engineer. I said, Download our build and double click it. And as long as they had VirtualBox installed, bam, they had our operational appliance running. It was really cool. Um, and that's, uh, uh, yeah, OK. And then you can take your baseline features, add on developer features underneath, create a build dev appliance. And by the way, baseline features would be like the kernel, glibc, anything else you could imagine would be common between those in a non-RTOS environment. So you add developer features, use your imagination, right? Whatever you find that you want um, in your development environment. We get requests for it all the time, what, what people want added to that. And that allows you to use Vagrant and QEMU. Um, uh, at the developer desktop, now to have a development environment that looks a lot like the flyaway environment. There is a provisioning stage that Vagrant allows you to do to, uh, that internally clones your project repository, sets up your environment, build an employer identical for all. The same build development of appliance, okay, we build in BuildBot into that. It's just a service that started. 
So our, our BuildBot infrastructure is completely serverless. We, when we make an update to the build dev appliance, my DevOps guy and I go, is it time to kill the bot? Yep, we're going to kill the bot. And we go in there, we just delete it. The only thing we care about is that enterprise hosted PostgreSQL database goodness that I don't need to worry about. Someone else gets to wake up in the middle of the night for it. And start it, Vault provides the credentials, bam, off you go. We don't need to worry about it. So I do not need to worry about our building burning down, which it almost did. You can check in the Seattle Times, the Boeing headquarters building, I came out and it was on fire. And that led to a massive change in the way we manage all of our software. Now it's all fully serv serverless because of one of those reasons. It was a famous one. If you see that, uh, yeah, check, just, just look in the Seattle Times, you can see it. Um, so the developer, technically speaking, could do system CTL start build bot if they want to. They don't. They don't know about it. They're not told about it. It's no big deal. But yes, they could start build bot. We have Vault that allows us to, to manage uh, credentials. OK. All right, so that is like the baseline substrate that we have the developers working in. OK, let's see. Oh, and we, build, we started out uh, with Ubuntu 16.04 as sort of our abstract environment to build this. And we quickly built our first dev appliance using Pyro in 2017. Then we use that dev appliance to build a THUD appliance. These are, by the way, the releases we've used as flyaways. And then we use the THUD appliance to build a hard knot appliance. You get the picture here? Okay. So we threw away the Ubuntu, and we don't use anything but our own stuff going forward. Uh, and then the next one, of course, I think it'll be Kirkstone. We'll see where things line up. Things, things move very quickly and also very slowly in aerospace, so it's, it's hard to tell. Um, OK, so the first thing is, uh, this is not controversial. We're just using an existing tool within BitBake. We use the pre-mirrors functionality so that uh, um, our appliance uh, is perfectly, purposely tuned to disallow access through the Boeing Enterprise proxy. Um, unlike a lot of companies, Boeing has a proxy inter internally. I can't SSH outside. It's bounced off. I call it the great firewall of Boeing. Um, and we've done even more to turn off. Uh, you can do like go through the web, and it goes through a giant massive proxy. But we've even turned that off in the build dev appliance so that when a developer does a build, it can't go out and grab source bundles. We've set the premiers variables so it hits our own internal uh, source registry. It's for good reason, right? Even though we in the project re repository, we check some everything. And we know if someone's meddling with it, no one's going to, I know I can, I'm comfortable, I sleep well at night, saying if developers pulled it from upstream, it's not that big of a deal. The problem is, is that in aerospace, I am responsible for reproducing that build as long as that airframe's in the air. How long is a 737 flying in the air? Think about that. Could be as much as 50 years if there's MRO, right? So. Um, that has to be repeatable, which means upstream source tends to disappear. It drives me insane the way people do like NPM packages and oh, just just update to whatever the latest is and hope you don't have a Bitcoin miner in your in your you know application. That's happened, hasn't it? Um, no, no, no. We pull down the sources and keep them uh, locked up in our own registry uh, for a lot of reasons. But the big one is like we have to reproduce that build uh, forever, basically. As long as I mean, I'll be long retired, but someone else has to. Um, the other one is we want to mirror the upstream repositories, too. We prefix, to make sure there's no confusion, the word mirror hyphen to these. But it's not, it should be pretty obvious what's happening here. We have a script that will just pivot. It's only a project admin does this. We have a script that pivots, creates a bare clone, and then pushes up the changes to our own internal mirrors. So they are bitwise identical. It's not a daily process that runs. The whole purpose is, and the next slide we'll talk about pinning, but the whole purpose is, is this allows us to very carefully track all the change and, and account for all the change that's occurred. Um, these are cloned locally to the developer's build, build dev appliance. They're pinned on a per distribution, per internal distribution basis. We'll talk about pinning here in a second. And it's updated by script by the project admins on a periodic basis. Uh, we review changes between updates. So let me get into, oh, sorry. Let me get into what I mean by that. So pinning is a really important aspect. We used to have our own homebrew pinning uh, uh, system. Big thanks to Alexander Canavan, who I hope I pronounced his name right, who came up with this setup layers tooling. Um, using that one instead, so it's a really cool tool. I uh, got a patch approved to make that item potent. So you can run this as many times as you want, and it doesn't make any changes unless you need to. So what does it do? 
your setup layers.json, which you're going to commit to your project repository, lists all of your layers that you include in your build, all your mirrors that you're going to use in your build. So setup layers will automatically clone those from wherever you're hosting them internally, GitLab for Boeing. Um, it ensures the remotes on it point to the internal mirror. So it makes sure that a developer didn't go in there and repoint the remote and then do something. It'll, it'll actually fix the remote. So it makes it look the same. Um, it checks out the mirror to the approved commit hash. That's what I mean by pinning. We pin to a hash so that our paperwork says this build was done with these hashes. It, it's one of those things where it's really easy to explain to a regulator. It's all built into the wrapper. The developers don't even know they're doing it. They do a build. Make sure these are checked out. Checked out to all the, make sure they're cloned. It's checked out to this pin. No thinking required, no error required. It just does it, it just works. So a project admin on a periodic basis will resync from the upstream mothership to the mirror and then look at the setup layers. That it's, it's all done by script. Look at the, uh, update the setup layers.json file with the new head commit, with the new hash at the head, okay? So now you do a git diff on setup layers.json, and what do you have? You have a before and after, right? And now for the change control board, you can just show all the commits in each repository and review them one by one. And if you do this often enough, like depending on how quickly they're developed, how quickly upstream is developing, it's usually like every week or every two weeks. Um, now, hard knot is um, end of life, so it's, uh, I don't, there's nothing coming in. Um, but it's just a, then at that point, you just go through change control board, or you pass them around to the senior developer and say, this is going to be a problem. So yeah, sometimes it is. And uh, we'll do test builds and stuff before we commit the update to setup layers.json. And if there's a problem, then we can override it with a BB append, right? We can override the recipe with a BB append. We don't like what happened. Maybe they, maybe just a well-intentioned bug fix update from 1.0.1 to 1.0.2 still causes problems. Okay, we can assess that, and we can BB append out and patch and do whatever we want. So remember, with open embedded in Yocto, the, the distro always wins. You can override anything below you, but you cannot override BB class changes, right? If there's a change in the build system, you cannot do that. So we actually have a way of managing that. We call it shimming. I'll talk about that here. OK, shimming. This is basically in your project repository, you're maintaining a set of patches for your mirror repositories. You're maintaining those, and you're, adding, you're, you're applying them. Obviously, nobody's manually applying these. You're applying these at build time so that anything that you have decided doesn't work quite right, or you're still testing, you're not ready to push it upstream, or that kind of thing, or more importantly, um, for example, there's some stuff we had to pull from Kirkstone into Hardknot, uh, like CVE check, right? We needed to pull some fixes to CVE check into Hardknot. Well, we need to, we need to pull those in as shim patches. Hardknot is, of course, EOL, and so um, I'm con I've considered uh, becoming maintainer, but I am I'm really busy. And so um, uh, maybe I could talk to Richard about that at some point. But I, I don't know. So this allows you to maintain a set of patches. There's also um, like um, system CTL, some of the system D functionality is actually uh, recreated, and we actually had to add some system D functionality. That we are, we're going to open source a bunch of these. So uh, another side trip, Boeing has a really good OSPO now, and they have um, given us approval now to push changes back upstream. So uh, when I find the time, I've actually got a bow wave of changes uh, we're going to push up to the project, uh, things that helped and I think that will help other people. And then, of course, all this patch is managed, all these patches are managed by script. We'd never expect a developer to apply these. It's, that's just fraud. So there's two schools of thought on how to apply these patches. Approach one, your script can just do a hard reset and a force clean, right? And it guarantees that you start from a clean slate. And then you just apply the patches in regular numerical order. Obviously, you want to, you want to enumerate your patches, right? And by the way, you can, this is a directory layout. Anybody who's written bash knows you could do this. And you could apply these in five lines of bash code. It's not that hard. And that was the reason for it. Um, it helps you out a lot that way. The other approach. So I'm the type of person who never felt comfortable getting a roof-mounted bike rack, right? And you know why, right? I just don't trust myself. So I'm more of an approach to kind of guy, right? Because we've all seen those pictures of the, ooh, tin can your roof. And I love my bike. Uh, so I'm an approach to kind of guy. Because you know I'm a project leader. And a lot of times, I'm the one mucking about uh, fixing something uh, in BB class functionality or applying something. 
and I'm going to get tired late at night, and I'm going to do a bit bake build and go, oh, no, I've, I've killed all of my work. And so I don't do that. I, don't, I do approach to. So the, in the wrapper we have all the developers use is the approach to approach. But also, there's an error condition, right? So one out of a 10,000 times, something will go wrong for reasons, who knows, where patches, and I'm going to explain what this is in a second, but where patch fails to apply. So we detect it, and we say to the developer, run the commands in approach one, and then just rerun your build. It's like literally copy and paste it. And that, that, that gets you out of trouble. That's your get out of trouble thing. Also tells me, oh yeah, uh, I know how to get myself out of trouble uh, when I'm working on uh, BB class or, or um, uh, core functionality changes. So patches are stacks. It's just a stack. So the way this works is approach two is you want to reverse apply the patches in reverse order. So you want to reverse apply three, two, and then one. But you don't want to look at the return code. You just ignore the return code from there. Whether it reverse applies or not, it doesn't matter. Then you want to forward apply the patches in normal order. And you do want to look at the return code there. If any of those fail to patch, you have a problem. That's when you just exit with a non-zero return code and then say, hey, run those two commands from approach one. Clean yourself up. You're good to go. I don't want to do that automatically because it's probably me who messed up. It's, all, it's usually me who messed up. And uh, maybe I'm just too tired at the moment. So, that's the approach for, for shimming. Um, this all comes together. This is where mechanism meets policy. So, uh, you know, um, this is where the mechanism meets the policy. So this is an example uh, where you're using your build dev appliance. The, the wrapper is just the BB command. It's obviously in your dollar path. It's your, your build dev appliances provision that into your path, BB. Passes through the bit bake command, maybe we're going to say, I want to know the build graph for whatever this image is, operational image minimal, whatever, who cares with that image. That's just a particular image, right? So in pseudocode, what this script will do is it'll do a pre-flight check. There's always things you learn about running a virtual machine on desktop environments. For example, virtual box, if you have more space, free space, in your, de in your virtual machine than you do in your desktop environment, you'll actually blow up your storage medium, your VMDK. So yeah, <laughs> yes. So you want to use periodically zero free to 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 clean your your image. Um, so we want we we have just every time you learn something, you can add a pre-flight check to this to make sure you're checking for common error cases. Uh, pr uh, properly provisioned, for example, is one of those. Um, uh, yeah, I'll get to it here in a second. Um, there's some provisioning here I'll talk about, and of course, sufficient resources is one of them. This will run the setup layers command to make sure your mirrors are cloned and pinned. This is the command line that it runs. Project conf would be your project repository. Your project repository was cloned in the provisioning <laughs> stage in your build dev appliance. Manages your sim patch, shim patches for you. Um, this is sourcing uh, your tooling into your child shell environment. So most people are familiar with this one. OE and it build env, right? So that's the one you dot in. That's the one you source in, right? Sometimes. Uh, if you're doing something exotic or weird, or you just want to use the the um, build tools that um, the uh, uh, Yocto project creates, you can sort it. You can set it to source those in first. That's this is all project admin level stuff. The developers don't know about this. And then, and then in this case, then the, the last thing you do is you 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 source in your init build environment. You give it your build directory, and probably less commonly known is you can tell it where your Bitbake repository is. If you use Pocky repository, then you don't need to use this. It's, it's all done for you. Um, and then, of course, this also manages your pass-through variables. Now, remember, we uh, our main flyaway deliverables was called a loadable software airplane part. These are uniquely numbered. Even a developer builds a desktop build, it's got to be uniquely numbered. You cannot ever have the same. So we use developer initials. Uh, mine would be CAW. Um, so when they first log into your build dev appliance, it'll ask you for your name and your initials, and it'll save that as dot files in your home directory. No big deal. These are passed through. And also, another thing that'll be saved in your dot directory is what we call a tail. It's a monotonically increasing four-digit um, alpha numeric number, except you can't use I, O, Q, and Z. Um, so we had to build some build. I actually wrote a bash function that will increment, yeah, 0 to 9, A through Z, Four digits, but skip I, O, Q, and Z. I, I, I did it in like 50 lines. I was, I was impressed with myself. So, um, so the, all of those things are passed through as pass-through variables. That's all managed by this BB script. And anytime we have to add a new pass-through or anything like that, that's all handled by that. So you remember, we're, we're not burdening a developer with any of this. Day one developer is just like BB, bitbake, image, go. In fact, uh, 
you can just say BB Bitbake and it builds all the images. So literally the first thing we tell developers to do on day one is documentation is like five lines. Clone, deploy, put this in the coldest room in your house overnight. <laughs> and you know why I'm saying that. Put it in the coldest room in your house, run, and then in the morning, uh, as long as you didn't run out of RAM, starvation, uh, you'll, you'll have a, a pre-cached build. And then after that, just keep your shared state cache. You're good to go. We have not experimented with um, a shared state, a read-only shared state cache server yet uh, because um, it will hide build errors. Um, it's getting a lot better. Um, it's, I'm, I'm assuming it's eventually going to be perfect, but at hard not, it's not perfect. And so obviously our nightly builds always, always clear of, our official builds through BuildBot are always clear of um, uh, cache. Uh, and I think that's it. Oh, yeah, and the last part is where it just passes through commands and arguments. So anything in the BitBake, you know, anything you would run, you know, on your desktop to do this here, and then any command you'd run after that, it just passes that through. So you can run any, any of the Yocto open embedded commands um, that you would normally expect to run. Uh, let's see. So developer workflow, pretty straightforward on their desktop. Git clone the project repo. Uh, prior to that, you know, there's, there's some pre-step to that where, like, if you're on a Windows machine, you got to install Git bash and stuff like that. If you're on a Mac, of course, you just get it for free if you just accept the developer license, right? Um, you do need to install Vagrant. Um, then it's just up, and if you're... Um, Sometimes I will have to email developers say we changed the provisioning a little, so just do a Vagrant provision. All of our provisioning through Vagrant is item potent. Uh, we do use the persistent storage plugin in Vagrant. Uh, we actually uh, added a Vagrant plugin that automatically manages the plugins as well, so the developers never have to manage their plugins either. It's literally just clone repo. As long as you have Vagrant and stuff, just Vagrant up, done. That's all done for you. Oh, and you gotta you gotta uh, put your keys in, right? That's the other. You gotta you gotta do your keys. I can't do that for you. And then either using Vagrant, you can SSH in, use Vim, I do that a lot, or use Visual Code through the SSH plugin, it's the same thing, right? And then you just run a command if you want to do your builds, B BB Bitbake or BB Bitbake in the image you want to build, straightforward, pretty easy. Okay. Um, the other thing is build everything from source. Um, don't accept binary blobs ever. It's not possible that's a panacea. But because, you know, there's licensing stuff or a previous developer compiled a version of Python 2.4 for 32-bit and never left instructions on how to recreate it. I mean, that could have happened. You know, who knows? Uh, so some of those have to be blobs. Uh, but you don't want blobs because you want to be able to leverage the full power of, of BitBake. CVE checks a huge one, right? And then manifest, you want to be able to tell what goes into your build. Graph is, you want to be able to tell what your build graph looks like, particularly like, why is this being pulled into my build? Well, it will tell you all the way down to the do step, which is mind boggling. And then, of course, reusability. I want to reuse that source somewhere else in another build. Um, you can't do that if you have a blob, especially for other architectures. Um, uh, developers initialize their shared state cache overnight to be pre-cached, um, so it's not a big deal that everything is sourced. You're not saving. I've had people try to really strenuously tell me, but you should have binary things so you can just compose their development environment and they run off. I'm like, you are not solving the problem you think you're solving. You're actually making it worse. It's everything you're telling me is solved by just setting your shared state cache overnight in one 12-hour build. And then you're set. You know, maybe delete it once a month or once a quarter if you're worried about hiding build errors. But otherwise, none of, none of this composition stuff, that's why I'm not a fan of Docker for this kind of stuff. Composition hides problems. If you build from source in your environment, I have an easier time telling a regulator I know what went into my build. That is a hugely important piece. So uh, not a fan of composition tools. And then, of course, nightly builds always start from zero cache. Um, OK. And then uh, uh, second to last, uh, uh, recipe generation is a really important thing because everybody's got their own favorite tool, Maven, great. Uh, Java C is like the worst offender. There's 75,000 different ways of building Java stuff, and everybody's got their own ways. So like we've had to build our own template scripts that will figure out the transit dependencies and create M.2 directories inside your build, uh, your, um, your sys root so that all the dependencies work. It's, it's a real pain. So you want to... You know, obviously NPM is built in a dev tool recipe tool. Um, you know, in my perfect world, there would be a lot of work put into automatic recipe generation for literally every build tool. Bazel should also be one of them. Bazel's um, really popular. Um, it, it, you should be able to take any existing open source project, run your template tool against it, and it should generate at least a reasonably close BitBake recipe that will work. It's very, very labor intensive initially. This is a lot of work we're doing now is to build 
a library of tools to automatically generate recipes. I do want to open source a lot of that as well. I think, I think that would really benefit the community. Um, so looking for help if anyone wants to work on that. Uh, yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, and then unsolved problems. OK, so distro switching. Tens of distros, right? I talked to you about that, right? And so uh, that means if I use kernel such and such in, in this distro and kernel such and such in this distro, it's not going to be easy to switch from that environment to that environment. So these are problems we haven't solved yet. Another one is like, OK, maybe I do have the same baseline features, but uh, I have a different, slightly different provision development environment. So we want to have a sort of a seamless way for a developer to run a command to switch their provisioning to another distro to focus on it. There's not, a, it's, it's, it hasn't been needed to solve now much because as you can probably imagine, developers are sort of attached to a distro. They don't need to nimbly move between distros. But the day is coming where they, where they will need to nimbly move. Or you're going to have, you know, like I'm, I'm a technical fellow now, so I'm expected to be cross-sectional. So I do need to like, oh, I need to reproduce that and see what you're seeing and how. And so distro switching in your build dev appliance environment is an unsolved problem that, you know, we need to tackle. Another one is internal meta layer reuse. So I talked about entry code. It solves a lot of problems, but it also creates a lot of problems. When you point your IDE at a code base that's in tree, uh, a giant code base that's in tree, you're going to get a lot of the red squiggly. We call it the red squiggly problems, right? Because if you've decomposed into separate libraries, well, it's not going to reach across to this other bit bake recipe. Because one of the cool things about meta layers is that you can rearrange where the recipes are located without breaking your build, right? But that will break your IDE connectivity. So we've had to do some really hacky stuff like put some .gradle files in certain recipes dash foo uh, directory to tie together at least to some point. But I think there's a better way of doing it. And I'd like, I'd like to explore that if there's a better way to do that. And then, of course, um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, project, actually, I was just talking about project repository code editing. Internal meta layer reuse would be if we do have a situation where a large entry code base in a meta layer that is used for one distro. There's another internal distro that will also pull in that as a BB layer. They will have to patch stuff when there's a disagreement. Uh, BB append patches on their side. I, I would also like to be able to point an IDE at their repository and get a coherent picture of what the source code looks like. Right now, we'll say, just do a bit bake all the way up to the do patch phase and then point it at the sysroot, and you'll get a full monolithic source tree there. That will assemble it. That will compose your source tree there. I think there are better ways to do that. Uh, and also for uh, cert reasons, um, in order to stay abreast of like the Linux kernel, once we get up to higher DAOs, we need, we need to be able to have massive amounts of patches, but have an IDE look at that, look as if it's a coherent code base. So having an IDE that will look uh, the, like, I call it the lens. You look as if you're looking at a coherent code base, but really what's happening is it's actually looking at a pile of patches. That's actually, there's a need for that, um, uh, for this kind of work. Okay. Um, so that is my email address. We are hiring software engineers. We are hiring Linux software engineers. We are hiring embedded Linux software engineers. We are hiring architectural Linux embedded software engineers. Okay, so there's some really cool opportunities. Uh, I just put the general URL in there. If you're actually genuinely interested, send me an email, uh, and we'll talk. Okay? But I'd like to hear from you if you're interested in doing this kind of work. I love it. My father works for Boeing. My father-in-law retired from Boeing. The guy who shepherded me through to the fellowship, his son works for Boeing. Uh, no, it is not a uh, nepotism party. It's, there is a very high bar to get into the company. It's, just, it's actually a great place to work. And so it really attracts people. And people don't want to leave when they get there, too. So with that, I'm sorry if I took all the time. Uh, I'll uh, 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 entertain questions. Yep, there you go. Thank you. Just wondering if you've been playing around with the automatic SBOM generation out of Yocto so far. Um, we are backporting. We're using HardNot now. So we are backporting the SBOM BB class functionality. Like, actually, there's probably like right now a developer's working. <laughs> I mean, literally right now. Okay. And that'll be a shim patch that we shim in. Okay. Yes. Yes. So. Yes. Yeah, we have a DO 356A is the cyber cert, and we're getting a lot of pressure now to, to we can show in the I, I'd be interested in any feedback you have on Absolutely. it because I think Josh is interested as well as is Richard. Okay. And so anything you're seeing, and if you see things that are weird, we want to know. So Thank you. Can. I will. Okay. <laughs> I will. <laughs> any other questions? You talked a lot about shimming, and I was wondering if uh, you considered, and 
probably discard, consider and discard the, the option of, uh, given that you're already mirroring the repository, mm -hmm. to just commit on top of the latest of the repository. So have your own yep. committed path queue on top of the branch. Yep, absolutely. And then you just rebase underneath it the, whole, right. the whole time, just push it up, yes. Yeah, I, I, there's nothing wrong with doing that. I have absolutely no problem with that. I think it's a perfectly good way of doing it. Um, I, I, again, for, for what I, I, I am trying to keep it so simple and easy to explain to the regulator that this mirror is identical bit for bit. I can prove it, except for the name is slightly different. It's along those lines. Uh, and the other thing is like, um, well, actually, no. I, that's, I mean, that's really kind of the, the case that, that, that does it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got one more time. One more time for do one more question. You, do you yeah. mirror your Vagrant plugins and the kind of that, those pieces of your dev environment, or does that come straight from the internet? No, no, no. Nothing ever comes straight from the internet except like a project admin will get it in there and we'll we'll do all the due diligence required to get it in our registry. But literally nothing is pulled from the internet when a developer does their deployment, uh, including they don't even. It used to be they had to apply the, but they don't even do it now. Like we have a Vagrant plugin that that applies the plugins, so that takes care of all of it for you. All right, thank you very much. Oh, do we have one more? Well, we have one more question. Yeah, is uh, your distro binary reproducible? Um, okay, so even with, yes, but, <laughs> so even when you, have, when you build a root FS, um, even the, the times are never, like, if you have a multi-threaded build, it's impossible to have a SHA-256 sum reproduce each time. So they're reproducible to the extent that a, Thread may land sooner than a thread in a different build, yes. But otherwise, yes, we have all the reproducibility turned on. It's not a priority for us because we don't qualify any of our tools at DAL D and E. So we only have to show evidence of functional tests passing. Yeah. yeah thank you. That's a very good question. Thank you. OK. Thanks. Um, and if you want to talk to me afterwards, I'll be happy. All right, thank you. <laughs>